my favorite type of bird. They are so pretty, so beautiful. Uh, and there's so many different types that live, uh, especially in this in this kind of area of the eastern U.S., live and migrate in the area uh, that, that the eastern U.S. is in. Uh, today in this Zoom workshop, I will discuss how to approach the challenges of warbler photography, how to use light to your advantage, as well as how I like to compose my warbler images. Topics that I'm going to go over today uh, will be, firstly, I'll talk about the basics of warbler photography, kind of how to start, how to get into it. Uh, with a discussion of why I love photographing warblers, some equipment that I use for warbler photography, camera settings, and lastly, some fundamental techniques for warbler photography. Secondly, I will discuss how to use light to your advantage uh, with a discussion of why soft light is best for warbler photography. Lastly, I'll discuss compositional techniques that I use in the field, uh, and that will include a discussion of backgrounds and foregrounds, and as well as anticipating warbler behavior. So this is an Audubon Club. So a lot of you guys will already know this, uh, but for anyone that doesn't, uh, warblers are their small migratory insectivorous songbirds. Uh, they are often quite colorful, which is my favorite thing about them. The colors on warblers are just stunning. It's like something out of a tropical, tropical paradise bird. Uh, they have often melodic or high pitched songs. Uh, They're found all over the country uh, and, and actually warblers, most warblers uh, are specific to the United States as well as North America and Central America. The, the warblers that they have in uh, Europe and, and uh, in the old world are not as pretty as the ones that we have here. And actually the Eastern US has the highest species density in the country and it's the best spot uh, to look for warblers. This is an example of one of my favorite warblers. This is a black-throated green warbler and he's perched in his favorite tree, the hemlock. Anytime I'm in hemlock territory, uh, when there's a lot of hemlocks everywhere uh, in kind of uh, New Jersey, I think this was in New Jersey. Uh, also, we have them in Western Maryland, uh, kind of around my area with hemlock groves. There are always black-throated green warblers singing. You can hear their uh, trees, trees, murmuring trees kind of song. That's the, the mnemonic for their song, uh, singing from the tops of the trees. Uh, and they're just really pretty. And I managed to capture this frame of this black-throated green warbler kind of nestled in this hemlock. Why I love photographing warblers. There are, honestly, there's so many reasons why I love photographing warblers and why you should try photographing warblers. Uh, the number one reason is they're some of the prettiest birds on the planet and they're extremely photogenic. Uh, secondly, you get to be out at the very best time of year. Often the warbler photography I do uh, is in April and May and a little bit into June as well, which are just, it's just gorgeous out uh, at that time of year and you're often in the forest. Uh, warbler, warbler photography lastly allows you to be immersed in nature. I'm often trying to identify the calls that I hear of warblers. Uh, which, in my opinion, kind of lends a certain closeness to nature that I feel kind of when I'm when I'm out when I'm hearing all the warblers, uh, when I'm seeing them and photographing them, it really allows me to be immersed in nature. This is an example of kind of uh, being immersed in nature in a, in a warbler photography experience. This is a bird called a black, uh, sorry, a blue winged warbler, uh, and his person a small viburnum tree. He was feeding all over this tree, uh, picking little insects from underneath the leaves. Uh, and it was just a gorgeous example uh, of how pretty warblers are and how pretty the habitats they live in are. Next, let's talk about the equipment that I use for warbler photography. Uh, for any warbler photography, since warblers are tiny, uh, a lens of at least 300 millimeter equivalent, so I mean uh, 300 millimeter or something that teleconverts to a 300 millimeter, uh, that's really essential uh, for warbler photography. Anything less than that is not going to give you enough reach for these types of birds. Uh, I personally use the Canon 500 f4 lens. Uh, and then next, the camera, I would say, is less important than the lens. Uh, and that's just because for any kind of camera that you're, buy, you're buying, uh, they go obsolete more quickly than lenses do. So if you're going to pay money for, for camera equipment, I would spend it on the lens rather than the camera. Uh, but for the cameras, I use this Canon 70 Mark II camera. Uh, low light capability matters for warbler photography because, as I'll say uh, later on in this, in this presentation, I'm doing warbler photography often on overcast days. Uh, so you want to have uh, a sensor that is good with ISO and low light. Uh, my support option for, of choice for warbler, warbler photography uh, is a monopod. I don't use a tripod because tripods are often quite cumbersome. And for warbler photography, I often have to be moving around a lot, uh, changing my angle, kind of uh, being mobile. Uh, I like to do that when I photograph warblers and actually when I photograph any type of bird. Uh, so that's why a tripod is a bit cumbersome. Uh, and I, for the monopod, I use the really right stuff monopod head. This is an example of being really mobile 
uh, for a particular warbler image. And this is an example where a tripod wouldn't have cut it. Uh, I was had my lens fixed to a monopod here and was walking around this field uh, where these golden wing warblers were singing. And I heard their call uh, from the roadside, got out, uh, kind of walked the edge of this field uh, with small little blackberry thorns and bushes. Uh, and I heard a song that was a little bit different, had a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a lower buzzy pitch that sounded like a blue winged warbler. Uh, and there it was, it was the Brewster's warbler, which is a hybrid of blue winged and golden winged warblers. Uh, it's actually the do dominant hybrid uh, in these species. The recessive hybrid is the Lawrence's warbler, which I've actually never seen. They're, they're a lot rarer than this one, but this one actually in, in and of itself is more rare than a golden wing or a blue wing alone. Uh, so I was super happy to find it uh, and photograph it. And he was just uh, feeding all over these little uh, blackberry thorn bushes hanging vertically. And I managed to get him right as about as he was about to take off here. Uh, I didn't get the wing spread because the wings were super blurry because warblers move really quick, but I got him kind of leaning out as he was about to take off. The camera settings I use for warbler photography, I always use aperture priority, mo priority mode for this type of photography, uh, which is mode A on Nikon because warblers move really, really fast. They're always changing angle and position, uh, hopping around trees and bushes and stuff. So if I'm using manual mode, I can't, I can't change the shutter speed uh, or adjust the exposure quick enough to compensate for how quickly the warbler's moving. If I'm photographing a bird that's more stationary, like a duck, I'm gonna be on manual mode, but for warblers, they're just moving around so quickly that there's not time to change the settings quick enough. So that's why I use aperture priority. Uh, I use a wide open aperture on this setting, which is F4 on my lens, uh, to let in the most amount of light possible. Uh, I set the ISO according to the amount of light that's coming in the sensor. Uh, and then the shutter speed, uh, as I said, for warbler photography is best left to the camera because they're moving so quickly. This is an example of those settings that I was talking about uh, kind of coming together for a shot. Uh, this is a prothonotary warbler, a beautiful little yellow warbler that lives in the swampy areas of the United States. Uh, and I was on aperture priority mode because he was bouncing all over the swamp really rapidly. Uh, and I was on aperture priority mode for that very reason. If I had been on manual mode, say he moved up to the sky, the exposure would be completely different uh, than if he was uh, down at this level and I wouldn't have gotten a shot. Uh, so it's really hard to compensate for that when you're in the field. So it's just better to go on aperture priority mode than manual mode for warbler photography. The fundamentals uh, of how to photograph a warbler are really attaining a foundation, foundational knowledge of warbler behavior. Uh, you really have to understand when they're going to be in certain locations, uh, where they're going to be. Uh, and this involves a lot of research uh, through eBird. Uh, eBird is a citizen science database that I use, uh, that a lot of people use. Uh, it's by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, where you can see uh, real-time recent sightings uh, of birds all over your area. I use that a lot to find warblers. It's a really useful tool. Uh, field guides are also really good. Uh, I for a while, a while back when I was a little kid, I was studying all the birds in the field guides because I just wanted to see them all. Uh, so I was kind of looking up all of them, looking up all their field marks. And that's a really good way to know uh, warbler behavior, learning about kind of where they feed in the canopy, what type of habitat they're found in, what trees they inhabit. Like, as I said earlier, if you're in a hemlock forest, you're listening for black throated green, black birdian, maybe black throated blue. You're not listening for prothonotary warbler or golden wing warbler. Uh, if you're in kind of a hedge grove area, you're listening for maybe chestnut sided warbler, blue wing warbler. Uh, so you need to know the kind of plants, the habitat, the seasonal migration that the birds have. Uh, and a good way to do that is kind of researching through eBird field guides. Also Audubon has a ton, ton of resources as well. Another tip that I give is try not to photograph warblers when they're in the tippy tops of trees. That's super hard to do because they're often in the tippy tops of trees. Uh, but I like to try to sometimes look for warblers that are more eye level. I do a lot of work with prothonotary warblers and since they're kind of mid canopy birds, uh, they're not as crazy hard to photograph uh, as some other birds are. This is a bird that's kind of a mid canopy bird. Uh, so they're often bouncing around at eye level, which is quite nice. This is a prairie warbler uh, and it was April last year and he was moving around this little cherry tree uh, and he gave me a little, nice little look here. Uh, with these beautiful flowers. Uh, one reason, as I said uh, before, I love to photograph warblers is because you're out in springtime uh, when the flowers are blooming, which is really nice. The next technique uh, that I, is just huge. If, if you learn one thing from this presentation, it's gotta be for warbler photography, you gotta learn the songs. 
uh, and, and learn the songs really well. So you know them when you're out in the field, you can pick them out. Uh, most of the warblers I photograph are heard first. Uh, without knowing the calls, uh, warbler photography or even finding them would be extremely difficult because they're very small. They're often uh, kind of concealed in the bushes. So if you're just birding with, bin with binoculars looking for them, it's gonna be really tough. Uh, a while back, I studied the warbler songs like flashcards. I'd play, not, not actual visual flashcards, but kind of auditory flashcards where I'd play a song. I'd uh, not know what that song would be, kind of pick, pick a random song from like an app or something uh, and try to, try to guess what it is and correct myself and kind of redo it until I, I learned all the uh, warbler songs. And actually at this point, I can identify all the warbler songs in Eastern North America just by ear uh, with that kind of practice that I've put in. Uh, phone apps, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Audubon, and, and this resource called Zeno Canto, which is a database of bird songs from all over the world. All those resources are super, super effective for learning your warbler calls. In the field, you, you don't have to actually know all the warbler calls in one go uh, when you're in the field trying to identify them because you can eliminate species based on location and habitat. Uh, so, I, so say I'm in, say I'm in a spruce forest in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm probably going to be listening for black pole warbler, magnolia warbler. Uh, maybe if there's a little brushy hedge grove, I might listen for morning warbler, chestnut sided warbler. Uh, say I go into higher elevation, uh, I might be only listening for black pole warbler because out there. So when you kind of know what species are in a certain location, you can eliminate things. Like if I'm in New Hampshire in a spruce forest, there's not going to be a prothonotary warbler. So I don't even have to think about listening for that bird. If I'm in a swamp in South Carolina, chances are the bird that's singing is gonna be a prothonotary warbler and not a Blackburnian warbler. So you can eliminate these species based on location. So when you're actually out in the field, there's probably only five to 15 warblers that you may have to choose from in a particular location, which makes it a lot easier to learn these songs. Uh, when I'm in the field, I'm kind of dividing the songs into categories based on pitch. So say I'm in that hemlock forest, the very top of the register when I get out of the car will be Blackburnian warbler with its really high pitched song. Uh, next, a little bit lower, uh, might be like black throated green warbler, uh, and then really kind of lower melodic songs might be, uh, let's see, black throated blue warbler is pr pretty low and melodic. Uh, so you're kind of dividing them based on pitch. Uh, and when you and when you hear, oh, there's a high pitched buzzy sound. Uh, so it's, I know it's not a black throated blue warbler. I know it's not a chestnut sided warbler. You know, let's let's see what it could be and kind of give it a good listen. And, oh, is it black burning? Is it Cape May? You know, let, let's let's kind of look at that closer. So when you divide the songs into categories based on pitch, it's a lot easier to delineate which exact species it is. This is an example of probably the toughest warbler song that I've ever had to identify. I, I did a trip up to New Hampshire uh, last summer uh, looking for warblers uh, and also other birds, but primarily warblers. And I'd never heard a bay-breasted warbler before in real life in my, in my entire life. Uh, I just Tried to learn it uh, through the, the through the apps uh, that I have. The Sibley app is one I use, uh, and I was just listening on this road, driving along this road where they had been, uh, according to eBird, uh, listening for this song. It's a really hard song to identify, in my opinion, because it sounds a lot like black and white warbler, uh, also like Kate May warbler, also like black pole warbler. It's quite similar to those other songs. So I was listening really hard for the for the bay-breasted warbler, uh, and finally heard one uh, and was able to identify it and photograph it. Uh, so that was really special because it was a bird that I'd never heard before uh, and it was really fun to actually be able to hear it and then see it uh, up close. In part one so far I've discussed why warbler photography can be extremely rewarding, some photography equipment and settings, uh, and then developing a foundational knowledge for warbler photography which includes knowing the bird's behavior and habitats, uh, and then lastly learning the songs which is so crucial for this type of photography. Next, I'll talk about more of a less of a birding perspective, more of a photography perspective, uh, the kind of light that I like to use for warbler photography. Lighting conditions uh, for this type of photography are a little bit different from other types of bird photography. Uh, when I'm photographing birds like shorebirds or ducks uh, or things that are out in open areas, I like to photograph on a sunny day at golden hour. Uh, golden hour is the time 15 minutes after sunrise and 15 minutes before sunset when the sun has a really warm golden quality to it. For warbler photography, that's actually not ideal uh, because most warblers live in dense forests. So the golden hour, the sunrise, the sunset light, that warm light 
is just kind of canceled out because the trees often block most of it. Uh, sometimes you can photograph warblers in sunny days, and I'll give an example of that in a second, but for the most part, overcast days are best for warbler photography. Uh, the light is flat and soft. You don't have harsh shadows and highlights like you get at midday sunlight. Uh, so you can create pleasing images uh, without having high contrast and muted colors from sunny day, midday light. This is an example of a cloudy day, an overcast day uh, with a warbler photograph here. This is a bird uh, called a black throated green warbler uh, and he is perched on a paper birch here uh, with some hemlock boughs in the background. Uh, and this was from my New Hampshire trip. I heard this song uh, while I was walking on this trail uh, and photographed him on this paper birch here. Second bird here uh, is a prothonotary warbler. This was taken a half hour from my house and he was hopping all over the swamp, landing on, the, on this mossy log and gave a big sing uh, because it was early April and he was singing all over the place, uh, trying to find a mate. This next uh, bird is a palm warbler. Again, on an overcast day, all these warbler images that I'm sharing right now were taken on an overcast day. And you can see the kind of softness in this particular image. There are no kind of harsh shadows and highlights. It's kind of a soft overall uniform tone. And that's because it was an overcast day. Uh, on overcast days, uh, I shoot it at four uh, because you want to let it in as much light as possible. I am doing ISO that's a little bit higher. So I push to 6,400 on my camera. Often I'm shooting 3,200, 1,800 for these images uh, because on a cloudy day, there's not a ton of available light. So you have to push your settings a little bit, but with most modern cameras, it works with, with cloudy light. Uh, this is a palm warbler. It's on its breeding territory. I had seen tons of palm warblers before in my life um, all over the place in North America. They're extremely common in migration but I'd never, never photographed one up north. So it's nice to see them in a tamarack bog in New Hampshire on his actual territory up north. Next, uh, I do photograph warblers in sunlight sometimes. It's tough to do because as I said, warblers are often in really dense areas, in forested areas where there's not a lot of access to open sunlight. Uh, front light is difficult to, to achieve, but you can kind of have filtered sunlight uh, where it's kind of filtering through the trees and creating a certain look in the image. Uh, this is an example of that. Uh, this was taken in backlight uh, and the bird stands out so much from the background because it was backlight. The, the background was in shadow and there was light kind of filtering through the trees which created a bit of a spotlight on this yellow throated warbler here. This is a second image of a warbler on a sunny day. Uh, this is a prothonotary warbler photographed in backlight at sunrise. As you can see, there's not full direct sunlight here, but it's kind of filtering through the trees, which created just a little impression of color off to the left here. Uh, this next image is on a very sunny day uh, where I'm photographing this yellow throated warbler uh, in backlight. Uh, and there was this bokeh in the background here. Uh, bokeh is a concept uh, that's, that's backlit. Uh, it refers to the way a lens refer, renders out of focus balls of light here. And you can see the circular objects are the bokeh that the lens is rendering in backlight. Uh, so this is an example of how filtered light uh, kind of streaming through the forest can look really cool in a warbler image. This is what's taken on a sunny day. This is an example of how uh, if you don't have an overcast day to photograph warblers in, you can often find warblers in the shade. If, if this particular scenario uh, was had been in a clearing where there had been plenty of sun, the whites on this black pole warbler would have been completely overexposed. There would have these shadows over here would have been way too harsh uh, because this, this was taken at 10 a.m. So the sunrise wasn't golden uh, at that point. Uh, so, but I actually ended up photographing this black pole, black pole warbler in the shade here, which uh, landed for a more even composition where he was kind of tucked into this particular red spruce. In part two, so far I've discussed how light relates to warbler photography the best lighting conditions for warbler photography, which are overcast days, and if you can, uh, golden hour sunrise, sunset, uh, and then some possibilities for warbler photography on a sunny day. Before the question break, I'd like to make a quick note about my post-processing. Uh, to photograph, uh, to post-process all my bird images, uh, I use Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. I do color, contrast, exposure, sharpening, crop, and lastly, undesired object removal adjustments in those programs. Uh, my goal is to rel replicate what my eye saw in the field uh, and the specifics of my workflow are complex, uh, but feel free to send me an email 
uh, to learn exactly about how I process my images in greater detail. Uh, let's do a question break. Uh, this is kind of the midway point uh, where it's time for a question break. I'm going to stop my screen share and we can get going. Um, all right, you tell me when you're ready. Yes, I'm ready. Um, um, well, Susan asked, well, we don't get, uh, I'm not sure if that's really a question, but we don't get to hear a lot about uh, Wobba singing here in Florida. Um, this a lot of this general comment, a lot of just this general general comments. Um, mm. um, does anybody have any specific questions for Cameron um, that you want to put in there? I mean, I know that you just made some general comments, but any specific questions that you want that you want us to address? If you do, you can put it, put them in there, and we'll we'll address them. Can you share? Can you share the camera settings on the on the black pole wobble image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the black pole warbler image. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I don't have it off the very top of my head. I can pull it up real quick. I I have it right here. Let's see. If if I can't find it in like fifteen seconds, I'll I'll just give a give a guesstimate here. I probably have it right here actually. No, no, no. It's uh, in the backlog of technology on this computer. Uh, so the settings for that particular image, uh, I was at F4. I always shoot at F4. Uh, the shutter speed looks to be about 1 800th of a second. Uh, I'm not using a really fast shutter speed for world War photography in this scenario because there wasn't a ton of light. As I said, it was in the shade. Uh, and then the ISO was around 1,000th, it looks, or 1,000th, it looks like. Um, what does it mean by open aperture? F4 uh, is wide open aperture. Uh, when you're using the lowest aperture number, which is on my camera is F4, uh, it means the hole in your lens that lets in light is wide open. Uh, so that's kind of why I say open aperture. Uh, so F4 is the open aperture. A closed aperture would be like F22 or a really, really high value. Um... If you're after, if 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 after prefer, do you find shutter speed lacking if if wobble hopping around? Um, sometimes there have been a couple scenarios where I could have um, I could have gotten a shot and missed it because the wobble was hopping around so fast. But uh, the main reason I use aperture priority is because warblers are hopping around so fast. The background is changing so quickly. The exposure is changing so quickly because they're very very mobile. They're just bouncing everywhere. Uh, so that if I was using manual mode, uh, even though I might get a more accurate shutter speed as far as stopping motion, the exposure might be screwed up uh, if if I had if I use manual mode. So that's the reason I use aperture priority for warblers. Even though sometimes I'm I'm having scenarios where the shutter speed's lacking a little bit, which doesn't happen often, but it sometimes mm -hmm. happens. Uh, I'm always making sure I, the exposure's on point, which is more important uh, as a whole uh, for me. Um, what is your Instagram name, and do you use a, a, AI de, um, denoise software as your high as your you as your high ISO settings? I just dropped my Instagram name in the chat. It's a uh, at Cameron Darnell Photo. Uh, I do use a denoise Topaz denoise AI uh, as as my software for for that. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic software. I'm not super expensive, which is nice. Instead of buying a whole new camera, you can just get Topaz denoise AI and have way better noise reduction capability. For like 70 bucks. Uh, let's see what I do use it for high OS, ISO settings. Yes. And what do you feel is the quickest way to learn wobble chipping sounds? Uh, chipping sounds? <laughs> chipping sounds are tough. Um, I do know certain chips uh, for particular species, uh, but I would say it just takes practice in the field. I've, I've tried to learn chips just based on like recordings and, and the apps. Uh, but it, for me, it's really tough unless you have experience here in the actual chip of the warbler. So the warblers that I've dealt with and, and seen and heard uh, in the field, I know the chips of, but it's, it's tough to just like learn them, learn them from a phone or from a recording because they're just also similar. Uh, so I would say just practice in the field, auditory familiarity uh, in that scenario. Um, where, do you set your cam your, where do you set your camera for focus? Where do I set my camera for? I use uh, autofocus as opposed to manual focus, and I use a single focus point, if that's what you're asking. Is that what you're asking? 
Brian, is that what you? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so the other question that came in, which I, I'll, I'll answer, um, uh, you can answer too, but, I, but I'll, I'll camera if you want. But um, Susan asked, I use a bridge camera, it doesn't really perform well over cast day. And, uh, any suggestions? Uh, for me doing birding festivals um, and me going out and doing events at birding festivals, I find the most po popular birding uh, bridge cameras that are out there for birding would be the Panasonic FC300, the Nikon P900, and the Canon, Canon makes a good one called the XX70. Um, those are all very popular for bridge cameras. Um, Sony has one too, but uh, I tend to, at the festivals, I, I, those are my three most popular cameras for people just getting into, you know, a photography or getting type of thing. Those are the three most popular cameras. I see young photographers when they're starting off, they tend to start with something like that as well. So um, any, any, um, any, any comments on that camera? Yeah, I would say uh, if you're struggling to get uh, photos in, with that camera set up uh, in low light, I would say if you're photographing on an overcast day, try to be out at midday because that's when it's brightest uh, if it's cloudy out. Uh, and also a bright overcast day, like a really socked in gray rainy day is not ideal. Uh, if you have kind of a brighter overcast, that can help with the amount of light that's being let into the camera sensor. Uh, and then if that's not working, maybe try a sunny day, like early morning on a sunny day, and maybe that'll help. Um, if you have any further questions, Susan, you can, um, you can send me an email. I'll put it, uh, I'll put it, I put my email in the chat, but I'll put it down again. I'm happy to answer your questions and you all, you can also attend, um, 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 Noah's, Noah's program and bridge cameras when you talk about that. But if you have any questions, email me and I'll be more than happy to help you out or, or answer any questions you have. Um, when you're shooting in a, in heavy foliage trees, how do you focus? How do you focus on wobbler? It's it's a lot of its practice. Um, I, I've missed a ton of images uh, over the years when I've been photographing warblers, and then eventually you get a little better at kind of tracking exactly where they are in the viewfinder. Uh, one one little thing is I use a single focus point. If you have a net of focus points in your camera, it makes it a ton harder uh, to actually zero in on that warbler. Uh, let's see. Don't use full. Uh, so there's a little switch on most cameras, not all cameras, uh, of the focal range that you're that you're photographing in. Full switch. If the switch is to full, it's usually like on the lens right near where the camera connects to the lens. There's a little switch. If you're using full, it's the full focal length that the lens can can reach, and that makes it hard to hunt for focus. If you're using 10 to infinity, which is what it is on my camera for Canon. Uh, then it's a lot easier to focus because it's not reaching, uh, tracking back and forth as, as for as broad of a range. Instead of the full range of the lens, it's just 10 to infinity. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a little tip for that. Uh, but a lot of it is practice. Um, I'll put the I'll put my email down in the chat, and I'll put the I'll I'll put the bridge cameras in in, in the chat as well, so you, so you have them. So um, we'll 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 go to the next session, and then we'll answer the other questions at at, at the end. Okay, great. I'll, I'll uh, hop back in my screen share and we can continue the rest of the presentation. The next section will be composition techniques for warbler photography. Backgrounds are really crucial when photographing these types of birds. Uh, the main tip that I give for backgrounds are avoiding and distracting backgrounds. Uh, and what do I mean by distracting? Uh, background is distracting when your eye doesn't go right to the bird. Uh, if your eye is kind of searching around, and I mean the viewer's eye, uh, went after the image is finished. If your eye is searching around uh, for all the kind of elements in the background, it's not drawing right to the bird, that means it's a distracting background. So the way to look for undistracting backgrounds or not distracting backgrounds is uh, a concept called subject isolation. Uh, subject isolation in photography is when uh, your subject is distanced from your background. Uh, if your background is really, really close up to your subject, that means you have poor subject isolation. The background is going to be chunky and not blurred out and distracting. Uh, for bird photography, I like to look for backgrounds that are very distant from my subject, uh, which have good subject isolation to not have a distracting background. This is an example of a really distant background. This is a palm warbler photographed up in the boreal forest in a little bog. Uh, and he was perched on this dead lichen tree. There were dead trees all over this bog and he was just hopping from one to one. Uh, and the background was just way far away. It was, it was must have been like 50 yards away. Uh, and this kind of color gradient that you see is uh, the green grass at the edge of the bog and then the gray dead trees uh, above them. And it just kind of flowed from the green to the gray here. 
Uh, and this is an example of subject isolation. The background was incredibly far from my subject. Uh, if this background had been way up close to my subject, it would not have been as out of focus and your eye wouldn't have been drawn to this yellow palm warbler. Uh, so this is an example of subject isolation, uh, which can lend uh, to a less distracting background. This is a second example of backgrounds uh, in bird photography. Uh, this is the prothonotary warbler and he is clinging to this uh, perch here. And the thing that I wanted to mention about this is texture. Uh, texture in, in, in kind of plants uh, is a really good way to accentuate your warbler photography. Plants are almost as beautiful as warblers, not quite as beautiful as warblers. I'm a birder first, but they are gorgeous. Plants are really incredible and diverse. Uh, and if you can feature them in your warbler images, that's always an added bonus. So this uh, little textured tree was really, really pretty in the rain here. It was wet with lichen and moss, and there were some little sporophytes coming out of the moss here that were cool. Uh, and it just lended a little bit of texture to the image uh, that I wouldn't have had without it. This next background, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the how to tell a story uh, of a bird in its habitat with a background. Uh, so this is a bird called a magnolia warbler uh, and the magnolia warblers breed in spruce forest. That is their summer residency. Uh, and he is actually perched here on a red spruce tree. This was in New Hampshire on his breeding territory. Uh, and he was uh, just feeding on little spruce budworms hopping over this red spruce tree. And in the background, there was a red maple tree uh, sorry, a sugar maple tree behind him. Uh, and the reason I liked the background of the maple tree, that hint of the maple tree, is because I was trying to tell the story of this magnolia warbler's life. Uh, when they migrate up the coast, especially around my area, they're often in deciduous forest. They're feeding on inchworms on the undersides of leaves and larva on the undersides of leaves of these deciduous trees, especially maples. Uh, so they're kind of migrating up the coast. They just depend on these trees to survive. Uh, and then when they get to their breeding territory in the summer, uh, they eat the spruce budworms on these spruce trees. So you have these two plants here in this image. You feature the spruce plant, which is its summer home, and the little background here is the maple tree, which is its uh, kind of fall spring migration home. Uh, so that's an example of how to kind of tell a story with a background in bird photography, uh, and also how plants can accentuate your kind of story in bird photography. Uh, warblers are so inextricably tied to plant life and insect life, so it's always cool to uh, focus on or, or uh, accentuate uh, the kind of botany behind a warbler image uh, with a really pretty uh, plant and also with another one in the background here. Next, let's talk about foregrounds. Uh, they're not quite as vital as backgrounds. Backgrounds make or break an image. Foregrounds often just kind of add to it. It's often a nice bonus. Uh, they shouldn't be distracting, but they can be uh, kind of additive to an image. Uh, shooting wide open, wide open f4, uh, lets you blur foreground elements and uh, you can use the shoot through technique when you do this. Uh, the shoot through technique is something I do a lot with warblers. Uh, just, I'm going to talk about it in a sec, but just to illustrate it here, uh, better than just explaining it on a blank slide, uh, this is the shoot through technique. It's when you shoot through uh, a foreground element that's in a focal plane before your subject or in front of your subject. Uh, you shoot through this blurred out foreground elements here to create kind of a fuzzy soft uh, layering around your sharp subject behind the foreground. That's kind of the shoot through technique that I like to use. It works really well with warblers because warblers are often in really dense forest in thick little groves and thickets and stuff. So if you can kind of find a little window where you have your single focus point locked in on that warbler here, uh, you can kind of create a little floaty image where the it looks like the warbler is floating on kind of green uh, substance here, which is really cool. Uh, and you don't, you don't always get warblers on like, you don't always see them on really plain perches. So this is a way to photograph them where you're kind of shooting through some thickets and, and greenery here to create a, a fuzzy foreground, which uh, not everyone likes, but I kind of like the image, the images uh, where you're kind of shooting through something and it looks like he's floating on, on a greenish background. This is the next example of that. This is a Canada warbler, a really pretty bird that inhabits uh, kind of all over the eastern U.S., more of the northern eastern U.S., uh, and he was perched on this little twig in the background here, uh, but there was a tamarack tree in front of him, uh, and he was kind of hopping around in this thicket, just dense thicket. If you've ever seen a Canada warbler, they're, they're real skulkers, uh, so he was just skulking back here, uh, and I uh, photographed him by shooting through this little window of this tamarack tree to frame him with these foreground elements here. 
this uh, next image of foreground uh, example of a foreground uh, is a small and frame kind of far away image of a Blackburnian warbler uh, with that flaming orange throat. Uh, there was this hemlock tree in front of him uh, and he was on this lichen perch really far away. Uh, and as I said, they, they don't always just give you a nice clean look. Uh, so he was just kind of doing his own thing here. Uh, and I shot through this hemlock, uh, which in some other scenarios, uh, if I hadn't lined, it up, lined him up in that little window, it would have been, I would have been unable to find focus, but I kind of moved around a bit to find that little window. That's why I use a monopod. As I said earlier, uh, I like to be mobile when I'm photographing warbles. I like to find little windows and areas. That's monopod perfect for the shoot through technique. You can't do the show, shoot through technique if you have a tripod because you, you're just not as mobile. You can't find that window quick enough to get the particular frame where you're shooting through the stuff in the foreground and do a focal plane beyond here like I did with this Blackburnian warbler. Uh, this next image is a bit of a shoot through. It's, it's not totally a shoot through because the background uh, was distant here, but uh, there are foreground elements here. This is a sweet birch tree he's perched on. Uh, and in the foreground, uh, there was another sweet birch tree here. I shot through it here into a focal plane beyond where the cerulean warbler was sharp uh, and the focal plane before it, uh, which, which, which was the tree was blurred out to create this look as if he's kind of floating on a green background. Next, let's discuss small and frame. Uh, warblers are really small, so they work really well for small and frame. Small and frame images, they show more of the scene. It's an attempt to transport the viewer into the field. Uh, it's trying to tell a story of the bird in its entire habitat, more of a wide angle, far away look at this bird. Uh, and it requires good subject isolation to work. This is one of my small and frame warbler images. It's kind of taking a step back. Uh, the reason I chose to photograph this yellow warbler in small and frame is because he stood out like a hot burning coal on this top of this little tree. I, I saw that bright yellow from a mile away. Uh, he was perched at the tippy top of this tree, kind of looking over this field. Uh, and the background was really distant, which uh, made him that yellow color uh, on him stand out really nicely. Uh, and that's why I decided to go small in frame because my eye was drawn right to him because of his yellow color. This is another image of small in frame. This Louisiana water thrush was uh, walking all over this stream, singing and feeding for aquatic invertebrates. Uh, he walked over this little log here uh, and was singing uh, with uh, gurgling water rushing underneath him. And it was just a really, really pretty scene uh, with uh, kind of telling the story of this Louisiana water thrush's habitat. They love uh, perching on these logs and rocks, uh, singing when they're on their territory in April, uh, just kind of establishing their, their domain on the stream. And they live in this really cool environment of these uh, gurgling streams uh, on the East Coast. Sharpness is also very important for warbler photography. Uh, warbler images uh, in general should just be as sharp as possible. Uh, some other styles of photography, you can kind of play with not having good sharpness, like with a pan blur uh, or with some kind of experimental techniques. But for warbler photography, it's often gonna be more of a portrait. So the image just should be as sharp as possible. Uh, to do this, I aim the focus point by toggling it through the viewfinder to uh, lock it in on the bird's eye. You always want the focus point on the bird's eye. That's really important because you want that eye to be sharp. Uh, toggling it correctly to the bird's eye in time takes practice uh, and sometimes I mess it up, but it's kind of the right thing to do uh, for world of photography because you want that eye to be sharp. Uh, if you're shooting F4 aperture, sometimes the tail of the subject is gonna be in softer focus. Uh, so that's why I like to aim the focus point at the bird's eye, which is often the focal point in the image. This is an example of that particular technique. Uh, see how the tail's kind of out of focus here, up at the eye and kind of what's important here, this front part of the bird is uh, sharp. Uh, this is a Louisiana water thrush again, except it's the exact opposite of the last Louisiana water thrush image I shared. The other one was small in frame, showing its whole habitat, the whole stream. Uh, but this is an extreme close-up moment where he was rock walking all over this bank uh, with these mossy logs here. Uh, there were these uh, little flowers on the bank that were growing all over the place. And he, he really, really was uh, a nice guy that day. He was he, was, uh, he happened to land right next to this flower as I was watching him, and I clicked this image here. Uh, and this is an example of sharpness in warbler photography. This is a second example of sharpness in warbler photography. Not only was I focusing on the sharpness of this particular bird here, you can see the feather detail in this prothonotary warbler. I was also focusing on the detail uh, of the perch he was sitting on. As I said before, uh, I like to, with warblers, you know, plants and warblers are linked and everything, that whole thing that I said. I love to photograph uh, warblers when I can include some kind of element of plants in the image. Uh, this is an example of that. 
Uh, there's a little mossy log in the swamp here. And there were sporophytes, kind of the new generation coming out of this moss here in the spring, kind of reaching for the little bit of sunlight that was filtering through the swamp with little water droplets on them, which was really pretty. So it was kind of a little bit of a macro of the plant with a warbler in it here in this image uh, where I was fixating on the sharpness of this particular bird. Next, uh, let's discuss behavior and anticipation in warbler photography. Uh, knowing the behavior and habits of your subject helps you anticipate the behavior. Uh, to do this, preparation, patience, uh, and kind of studying what kind of behavior the individual warblers have uh, is key. Uh, feeding, singing, and preening behavior, that's pretty much all warblers do. They don't do much else, but you can get those particular behaviors uh, with warblers. This is feeding behavior. Uh, this is a uh, behavior called forage gleaning, uh, whereby warblers tuck their uh, leaves under the undersides of leaves and kind of pluck out larvae and inchworms from, that are clinging to the undersides of these leaves, particularly in spring. Uh, this is a golden wing warbler, one of the coolest warblers in the United States here uh, with those golden wing bars, which is the quintessential field mark. Uh, he's perched on a red maple tree uh, and doing that forage gleaning behavior here. Uh, and this is an example of uh, one of my behavioral images with warblers. Uh, the second image example uh, is an image of a Kentucky warbler, and he is uh, carrying a little uh, inchworms and flies. He's got two insects here, actually. I hadn't noticed that before. He's got a fly and maybe an inchworm here. He's carrying that back to his nest. Uh, and I was just watching him from a distance here, and he, was, he always landed on these kind of perches before he popped back to his nest. Uh, and I managed to capture him with food in his beak here. Uh, this is a preening behavior. This is a magnolia warbler, one of the prettiest warblers, and he was just preening his feathers here while resting on this little perch in the spruce forest. Uh, lastly is another example of feeding. Uh, this is a Brewster's warbler on a blackberry species uh, bush, uh, and he was uh, feeding all over this little field, again doing the forage gleaning behavior where he tucks his bill into the undersides of these leaves, looking for these inchworms. Uh, this is a particularly brown inchworm, not a really green one, which I was, I was kind of bummed it wasn't a green one because the green ones are so pretty, but it was still cool nonetheless uh, with this inchworm in his beak. The takeaways from this presentation, I would say, uh, are firstly, a lens of 300 millimeters or greater is best for warbler photography. Next, shooting wide open or F4 aperture, or uh, whatever the lowest aperture you have on your camera is, uh, with aperture priority mode is what I do for warbler photography. Uh, try to be at eye level with your subject. Uh, it's tough for treetop species. Uh, so try to look for species that are more found at eye level. Like uh, the guides have it all over the place. Uh, they have um, kind of sections and paragraphs about what level of the canopy these birds are found in. Uh, generally, just to rattle off real quick, Cape May warbler, bay-breasted warbler, black pole warbler, black blurnian warbler, they're all found in the tippy tops of trees. Some birds that are great to look for in Florida would be prothonotary warbler uh, at eye level. And also the migrants that come through uh, often that are at eye level like black throated blue, chestnut sided, water thrushes, those kinds of birds that are more in the mid story uh, kind of lower canopy area. Avoid shooting in harsh midday sunlight. Uh, it's best to shoot in overcast or if you can golden hour, uh, think critically about composition uh, and the elements apart from your subject to create better images. And then lastly, the biggie uh, is learn the songs and make sure you know them because that's the foundational element for warbler photography. Otherwise, it's hard to identify them, hard to find them, and you don't, you don't really get anywhere if you're just kind of walking around looking for them. So learning the songs is really important for this type of photography. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. I hope you enjoy this presentation. I hope you learn something new. Uh, I have a website. I dropped the link in the chat. It's cameradarnellphotography.com. <laughs> Uh, I have, uh, I have a fine art print for sale on that website. All the images that you saw in this presentation today will be available for fine art prints at a discount for you all. Uh, it's a 10% discount. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me, my Instagram, I also linked that in the chat and I linked my email in the chat as well. Uh, lastly, if there are any questions that may have come up uh, while I've been talking, uh, we can do a final question break and I'll answer as best I can. All right, so we had some questions that came in. Um, before we get to the question break, um, do you want to just talk briefly about your the burning the Space Coast Burning Festival thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, so I'm co-leading uh, a virtual workshop uh, with another, another, photographer, another photographer named Ray Hennessy uh, for the Space Coast Virtual Photography Experience. 
on March 26th. Uh, I will be discussing how to push your creativity in all types all of types bibliography. Of I will be kind of bouncing some ideas off of him and he'll be uh, co-leading it as well. Uh, you can either sign up for the whole festival, which includes, I think, what is it, Gary, 11 presentations? It's kind of a whole package deal. Uh, and then there's also, there's also the Bird and Wildlife package, uh, which is more of a limited package, it's a little cheaper. Uh, and you get access to live broadcasts, uh, either nine or 11 live broadcasts, depending on how much you pay for all types well, of wildlife well, 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 uh, and also uh, the videos of the presentations afterwards. Uh, I will link that in the chat right now. Um, all right, so um, the, um, you, you, the first question came in, do you use live view or, or, or the eyepiece? Uh, I use the eyepiece for World of Photography. They move so quickly, uh, it's difficult to use the live view mode. Um, also, AI server versus one shot versus focus. Uh, I use AI servo. Um, for comparisons, what are your camera settings for flight? For, well, you don't. I don't think you, you don't do that. You have flight for flight birds. Warblers are, warblers are tough to flight. Uh, that'd be a that'd be a easy or a very very difficult challenge to do for, for other birds in flight. Uh, for comparison, uh, I am using sometimes manual mode uh, because for birds in flight you want that sharper uh, wings, uh, higher shutter speed. So I'm using between one one thousandth and one uh, four thousandth. Uh, of a second for the shutter speed. I'm using F4 uh, and I'm using whatever ISO the scene is. Uh, if it's a bright sunny day, I'll be using a low value like 100, 200. If it's a cloudy day when there's not a lot of light, I'll be using a really high value like 6400 or 3200. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? You just got, you just, um, a lot of stuff that came through that said you were amazing, you were the best. I mean, just so much good stuff came through. Someone said you're the best, so knowledgeable. Um, and there was so much great stuff that just came through. Uh, about how, how, how much you love the program. Um, anybody else have any specific questions at all for Cameron or anything else that you wanna put in or questions or anything? You can put them in there we'll, we'll, and we'll answer them. If you have anything at all, just put them in there. I'm just gonna jump in with a few comments. If anyone <laughs> has any questions, <laughs> feel free to type them in and uh, Gary yeah. will read them out. Gary, as I make some of these comments, if you wish to elaborate or Jay, uh, just feel free to chime in. <laughs> Just to follow up on some of the comments, uh, one of the comments of the camera, if you are using a zoom lens, meaning not a telephoto lens that is a prime lens, but a zoom yeah, yeah, yeah. typically a zoom lens can shoot in a macro mode or focus. focus. Stuff. And what Cameron meant by flicking the switch to 10, millimeter, 10 uh, meters or, more, or 10 feet or more, I forget what he said your lens will actually focus faster in general, regardless of whether you're using a full size, uh, full frame camera or otherwise. Uh, one of the other things I want to mention too, is if you're like Cameron or Jay shooting at very high ISO, uh, typically a full frame camera or a full size sensor camera handles noise inherently better than a reduced size sensor. If you're shooting with a reduced sky sensor or an APS-C sensor, for example, if you're shooting with a 400 millimeter lens, because of the sky sensor, you get approximately a 1.4 magnification, which turns your 400 millimeter lens into a 560 millimeter lens. And uh, Topaz Denoise AI is an amazing noise reduction piece of software, as Cameron mentioned, it's very affordable. If you don't need it in a hurry, it does tend to go on sale for $15 on average once in a while. Any, Any comments, Gary or Cameron? <laughs> um, no, I mean, no, I think that the Topaz is a really great software. A lot of birth targeted and people use it. So um, I definitely highly recommend you get that. It's, um, it's, it's been around a long time. It's, it's a well-established company where some of these other software companies come and go and they're, they're, they're popping for, six, for three months and then, they're, and then they're out of business or they, they don't hear them. Topaz is a very legitimate software company. They've been around a long time. They make a great product. So I definitely, I don't personally sell Topaz, um, but I encourage you to get it. There's many, there's, there's many photographers that have affiliate programs or have programs you can go to and get a discount. You just look them up and, um, and there's different type of things um, that you go to to get it. So 
Um, but if you're not in a hurry, definitely wait for a sale. Topaz has some amazing sales and I uh, definitely wait. If you're not in a hurry, wait for that sale and um, you can get it at some time at some pretty inexpensive pricing. Um, so if you are looking for to learn more about Topaz, I actually just, um, I actually just um, um, hooked up with a guy from Topaz and he and he, he can now do programs. So he's now want to do programs at Camel Clubs. So if you're looking for a program of Topaz, I can bring that guy to you to do programs for you guys. Um, so any other questions at all? If you have any questions for me or Cameron, was, feel free to put them in there. There was one more question that was messaged to me. Uh, uh, Kristen asked, uh, are there special settings for the shoot through technique? Uh, the one setting, uh, the settings that I'd focus on for that are not actual exposure settings, but focus settings, uh, have a single point uh, for the shoot through technique. Uh, and then I recommend putting your lens not on the full, uh, as Alan said, not on the full uh, length of the focus mode. There's a little switch uh, that has, says full or a number to infinity. Uh, put it on the one that's number to infinity. For me, it's 10 to infinity uh, to make sure it's not tracking the whole distance that you can focus just a smaller window of it. Uh, so that helps you attain focus uh, for the shoot through technique. As far as settings uh, for exposure for that technique, uh, F4 enables you to blur out the foreground and that's effective for the short shoot through technique. So I'm shooting F4 for that. And the ISO and shutter speed are gonna vary uh, depending on the scenario. Well, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for oh, attention. Cameron, I really, really, you have an outstanding presentation. Thank Gary, you. as always, well, thank you for your support. Is there any other questions or comments? Um, I just have to say that I've been on, I just have to say in my end, I've been on many Zoom presentations since the pandemic, but um, you guys were not saying that other ones were, but you guys were a very friendly group, very engaging, uh, very engaged, very friendly. And it's, it's been hard sometimes to get engagement or get friendliness on certain Zoom things. It's been, it's, some have been, some have been a, some have been a challenge, some have been cold, some have thing, but you guys are really very friendly, made me feel welcome. I'm um, sure I made feel camp right from the very beginning. And it was, yeah, it's right. nice, to, it's nice to see that. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thoroughly agree that he's right. You know, it's sometimes it's difficult for the virtual platform to get people to kind of ask some questions and say stuff, but yeah, you guys are great. So I'm super happy to be here today. Well, everyone, have a great evening. Thank you. And uh, remember what I said. You'll see a couple of announcements coming across email. Yeah, and I did send. I did send out. I did send Jay the special, so they'll they'll he'll send it out after the thing. So, um, thank you guys. Have a great night, and thanks for everything. Thank you again, Cameron. Thank you. Have thank a nice you. Night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have thank you night, all. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for joining us. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah I was, really. I was actually out birding, and I just got, and I, and I, I drove home a little bit too quickly, but I, I got here for close to it. We appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> so did you see anything interesting this evening? Um, nothing different, just some nice looks at some, I had beautiful looks at a prairie warbler, at, at a nice. prairie warbler today. I didn't have my camera, but I had great looks at them though. Where did you go? Just peaceful waters. Close. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Very nice. But we had a good turnout tonight. Almost oh, yeah. 30 people. I thought with it going in Audubon, we would have gotten more. But well, I, I think more people registered. I think just not everybody showed. Right. Right. Did you but it was really very interesting. Yeah. And I took advantage at the end to just throw in a little bit of technical. Uh -huh. I know not everyone would quite grasp what I said, but at least it will stimulate questions if they didn't. And, and yes, it's good to shoot at high speeds. And I have a crop sensor and a full frame camera that I shoot both at 32. And I shot at 64 under two, but it's usually around 3200. Well, when you and I did the critique session, one thing I forgot to point out to the attending members is how different Jay's and my approach is to photography. And I had wanted to mention that so that people know there are many different ways to what to accomplish whatever your goal is. So in other words, because you use manual uh, doesn't mean the technique you use is not different. You know, like I said tonight, 
J tends to use a lot of very high SOs with a lot of very high uh, shutter speeds, whereas I am the absolute opposite to J. I tend to shoot pushing it a little too much, and I suffer the price with a bad image more than I'd care to admit, where I'm pushing for the lowest possible ISO with the lowest possible fast enough shutter speed so I don't have to deal with as much noise. Uh, you know, and it's been a quirk I'm trying to not, uh, I'm trying to stop that because I lose sometimes a very good opportunity because I'm so hung up on not creating too much in-camera noise because of ISO. So it was nice to see tonight, you know, not just when Jay was critiquing, but tonight someone who's using very high ISOs using denoise and the quality of his images, if people are as sensitive to noise as I am, it's one of the first things you notice. So I posed the question because I knew he was using denoise software. You could tell just by looking at his images based on the settings he said he's using. So it's, it's very interesting. And I think it's good for the attending members to at least hear the concept, even if they don't quite grasp it. And I think a lot of members may not quite grasp the zoom factor from a reduced size sensor. Oh yeah, definitely. So that's why I said it can turn a 400 millimeter lens into a 560 right. millimeter lens. And you yeah, know, so, you know it, it's funny, I shoot with a crop sensor and most of my wildlife photography, I, I'd have to say I've been more successful with a crop sensor camera and shooting birds in flight or uh, like the otters wrestling the other day um, than I do with a full frame. Um, part of that's me and probably part of it's the way I approach it, but I do a lot of what Cameron said. I only shoot a single point and um, yeah, I find it works, but it, it goes back to the individual. What do you feel comfortable with? Right, exactly. What are you getting the shot you like with? Right. You so know, you gotta try. And with shooting warblers, he's, it, there's, it's very, as you know, when you're shooting little guys like that, it can get very frustrating. And so I think, you know, he's, I also let the camera max out at 6,400. And it's, it's to get the shot because otherwise right. you, you know, you just, I, you're trying so hard to get that warbler. Right. It can be so frustrating and you get one opportunity maybe or two opportunities. And so you want to get that shot because right. otherwise it's behind a branch, it's behind a twig, there's a leaf in front of it. It's moving. I mean, it's, they're in constant motion. They are so difficult to shoot. The Scott, one that's what you wanted. use first mode for and you, the delete yes, when you go to edit. <laughs> <laughs> I've been known to take a lot of photos and then delete a lot of photos. Yeah. I yeah, was going to say, photos, I yeah. did I did bite the bullet one time in Fort Myers Beach just before sunset where skimmers were actually feeding on the beach in an ephemeral pool that was maybe four or five inches deep. Mm. And I bit the bullet and I turned my ISO up to 1600. Oh my God. <laughs> Which for me was, I want the shot. And you know, Scott, I don't know if you remember, or Nancy, it was the shot of the uh, black skimmers and they had water spraying up behind I them. Do. I do remember that shot. Yeah, that was from last season. And that's probably a picture I'll enter into the Audubon, uh, National Audubon Photography Competition. Uh -huh. so, yeah. See, I, you, you actually uh, increased your ISO, but you got the shot. That's yeah, it. but they won't allow, their, and their guidelines are so nebulous. They nebulous say, or strict? Well, yes, but I don't mind the strictness because it is one way I view it as they're purists. And yeah. it's just to look at what they're doing. They don't want fake enhancement. And I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they're encouraging people to photograph nature at its best unaltered. So there are all these different ways to look at it. Uh, the one thing I couldn't understand is in the last part of their instructions, they, I forget how they phrased it, but they said excessive denoise, uh, denoise of, a, of an image. Well, what's excessive? Yeah. How are they going to know? So I don't know if to apply any kind of denoise to my image because I don't want to get 
uh, you know, I don't want to be kicked out the competition because- well, Alan, notice how you noticed the uh, uh, Cameron using denoise. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I guess if they notice it, that means it may be excessive. I don't know. But but, but what constitutes excessive? Right, right, right. I know. That's, that's a lot. I mean, if he's even in Lightroom, a lot of the the capability to remove denoise at the higher, you know, ISOs, I was very successful with that, and held off getting um, AI till about a year ago. Um, and I, you know, shot a lot of moving birds and animals and things. Well, here's the caveat. If you look at their instructions and the judges want to verify your image, they will ask you for your original or raw right. image. It was uh, just how much that. you've saturated the image, yeah. how much you've altered the image. So it's not just if the software you use does it. They look, because in a raw processing, you can saturate an image, you can denoise an image to some degree. Uh, it doesn't mean it's carte blanche on it. They're going to look at your original image and they're actually going to go, oh, Jay really wanted to make the beak on this black skimmer look really intense. He overdid it. He's out. <laughs> you know, I think they do that actually mm -hmm. based on the yes. read of the instructions. It'll be interesting. Yeah. I'm so gonna go. anyway, it was, it was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, short and sweet, which is my favorite. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of people ask for the recordings. So yes. I'll talk to Rich. I uh, Just so you uh, knew, I had technical difficulties on my side. I don't know if any of you noticed, but I vanished for a while. Right. I don't oh, know I, if I it's thanks that to You were very garbled at times. Yeah, and I think everybody was at some time. Yeah. I do, but I actually got kicked off. And I think AT&T in my area was not very nice to me tonight. So I couldn't start recording until I logged back on. And uh -huh. coincidentally, it was right as Cameron began speaking. So unfortunately, all of the intro will be missing from the recording. Not the worst thing. But what I'll say from this point forward, Jay, is if you notice at the start of a meeting, it's not recording, because you have the privilege as well to record, please check. Okay. Because I find a couple times now with my Wi-Fi, I have had technical difficulties. And unfortunately, tonight was another one. So Jay, a maybe what we'll try and do is I'll try and record the next couple okay. and just see where we go from there. Regarding the oh. recording, uh, just one quick question. Uh, I know we've been having trouble with the YouTube account, um, apparently the password.